Hello friends, you are watching 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. I'm Ryan Day, your host, or at least one of them. And we're excited that you're joining us for another week, week number six in our study on God's mission, my mission. And the panel is locked and loaded and ready to go. We're excited to talk about how we can be motivated and what should be our motivation behind witnessing to others. And so I'm gonna introduce the panel at this time to my direct left, we have Miss Shelley Quinn. Oh, I've got Monday's lesson, a prophetic foundation. It's going to be great. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. And Pastor John Lomacain. Mine is Tuesday, waiting and mission. God's timing and our timing are not the same. Oh, that's for sure true. And next to you, Miss Jill Morricone. Thank you, Ryan. I have Wednesday, whom you crucified. All mm. right. All right. Good one. And then last but not least, I want to say Dr. Surgeon, <laughs> Daniel Perrin, always a blessing to have you, brother. Thank you. I've got Thursday lesson, a picture of the early church, the example of people who walked with Jesus. I got you. I got you. Praise the Lord. It's going to be an exciting study. And my friends, I'm going to encourage you. I know you often hear pastors and ministers say this. But get your Bibles out mm -hmm. and follow along with us. See the text for yourselves. Um, get you something to write notes with, pencil, pen, paper. Uh, take some notes because, you know, again, when you hear it, when you see it, when you write it, it helps to stick in your mind. I have people often ask me, Ryan, how do you, how do you remember so much Bible? And it's not because I just have a great memory. It's because I, I, I embed and engulf myself into that and I'm always writing, I'm always typing it, I'm always listening to it, I'm always watching it. So it helps to remember the scripture better when you're including all of those different elements. So before we go any further, let's have a prayer and then we will dive into our memory text and Sabbath afternoon's lesson. So Brother Daniel Perrin, would you have a prayer for us, my brother? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, with, uh, with our full hearts, we come to you willing to, to listen to what you speak and willing to follow it. Lord, our willingness comes with the weakness of humanity. So give us the strength that comes from your throne yes. to understand, to follow, to obey, and to love walking the path that Jesus walked for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Our memory text for this week comes from Luke chapter 24 and verse 44. And the Bible says, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And it is those words that we want to heed as we talk this week about our motivation and preparation for mission. My friends, what is your motivation behind witnessing? Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked a little bit, maybe referenced a little bit in some of the previous lessons so far, but this week we're focusing on just that. Uh, we need to be motivated and we need to make sure that our motivation behind witnessing and sharing Christ is in the right place. And uh, also how to properly prepare before we go out and make sure that we're following God's plan uh, indeed as we're preparing to share the gospel with others. I want to start with Sabbath afternoon's read here. It says, Paul wrote to the Philippines, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. And he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. I love that. And the lesson goes on to say, of course, that comes from Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. And uh, the lesson goes on to say powerful words, exclamation. Uh, Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and that is what mattered to Paul. Ideally, though our motives for preaching Christ for mission, for reaching others and with good news should be out of love and out of truth and not from selfish ambition envy or strife. So what then are some of the motivations for preaching Christ? And what are some of the ways that we can prepare for doing this? This week, we will look at just that and determine what are these motivations. And of course, Sunday's lesson sets us up nicely for the very first one, which is to share the good news. And uh, the, the lesson has us going to Luke chapter 24. 
verses 1 through 12. This is a, 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 an interesting story, one of my favorite stories I like to uh, revisit often. Uh, but of course, this is within the context of the risen Savior. Jesus has obviously died and given up his life. He's been buried in the tomb. And now it's that early morning Sunday and the women are on their way to the tomb to finish preparing the body of Jesus to be laid together for, or laid aside or, or buried forever. But they go and find that that tomb's empty. So notice Luke chapter 24, verses one through 12. It says, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. They returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11 and all of the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanne, Mary, the mother of James and the other women with them who told these, these things to, be, to the apostles and their words seemed to them like idle tales and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooped down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. Yeah. And so these ladies arrive at the tomb. They see, uh, they see obviously there's no body there. And then these two angels visit them and say, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you here looking? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? Jesus has risen. Go and tell the others. And they did just that, but they show up, they tell the 11 and the Bible says they did not believe them. How many times have you witnessed to someone and they didn't necessarily respond in belief to what you were telling them. Mm. Or maybe it was you on the receiving end. Uh, in other words, you were the receiver of the message, but maybe you questioned the validity or the veracity or whatever it was of something that someone was telling you. Uh, maybe there was a little bit of un unbelief or disbelief in your mind as to what someone was telling you. Sometimes we deal with those things, but this lesson is bringing about the fact that at the end of the day, it's the Holy Spirit's job to do the conviction. It's our job to bring that message. But oftentimes we need to make sure that when we, well, I wouldn't say oftentimes, I would say every time, make sure that our message is indeed Christ-centered. That at yeah. the end of the day, when you are telling, uh, when you are trying to witness to someone, it may not always have to be some deep theological conversation. In this case, the message that the women were responsible for delivering was the simple message of the Lord has risen. His body's not there, right? They didn't have to go back in and say, boys, sit down. Let's, let's remind ourselves of the scripture and take them through a deep uh, Bible study. Now there's times for that and there's times for deep, deep theological reflection on the word. But oftentimes we sometimes overcomplicate witnessing and we think that we have to prepare some deep theological conversation or study when in reality, many times what that person needs to hear is the simplistic message of the gospel, the good news of Christ and him crucified and him risen. And so, uh, you know, I, I just want to just give a little example here of, of, of witnessing. You know, I remember years ago I was in the woods. I went hunting with my dad. We were out in the woods. It was, uh, it was a spring. I think it was during the springtime as the winter was changing to spring, but it was the last couple of days of hunting season. We were in the woods. And of course, the way my father always liked to hunt is we would, we would get in deer stands. But these were the deer stands that didn't have the ladder. They were called climbers. You literally had to wrap them around a tree and manually climb up this tree as the meadow would dig into the tree and you would climb up. And we would get up into the trees 20, 25 feet so that we would be out of the height and out of the smell uh, lane, I guess you could say, of the deer so that we could make sure that we were, you know, basically putting one over on the deer so they couldn't see us and smell us. All of that to saying, I remember one day we were in the woods and all of a sudden there was, I heard something loud off in the distance that was clearly a gunshot, pow, really loud. Mm. And then a few, just not even a second or two later, I heard and some limbs fell. And before you know it, another pow, Pow, 
we realized within a few seconds that there was someone over the levee just across the road from us who was shooting and they were shooting in our direction and the bullets were flying in our direction. It was very, very scary. I remember that day as a, as a, a young man that was kind of just, again, uh, deeply struggling with my own faith and whether or not I even believed in God. But I remember that day I cried out and I said, Lord, please let us get out of this situation unharmed. It was very scary when you have bullets flying at you and you don't know which, at what point, especially when limbs are flying around you because the bullets that are being shot are clipping the limbs just within feet from, from you in the trees. And so I remember saying that prayer that day and we got out of there alive, praise the Lord. But I remember that was a step towards me going, mm, is there really a God? Does he really hear my prayer? It wasn't too long after that, that I had my, uh, I had an appendicitis attack where my appendix were about to rupture. And I remember crying out to the Lord and saying, Father, please save me. Please, if you can get me through this, I would, I would serve you. You know, we make deals with God. I don't, I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying making deals with God is a good thing, but that day I made a deal. Lord, please, I will serve you if you get me through this. And he did. He got me through it. That was another step to me saying, wow, is there really a God? And Lord, are you really hearing my prayers? And then I remember not too long after this, someone put a set of DVDs in my hand, all about Jesus Revival Seminar by Lee Vinden. I watched these DVDs and it helped introduce me to the God of the Bible. That it's not about what we do, it's who we know and who we know changes what we do. And that there's a God, the God of the Bible that wants to have an in-depth relationship with you. And I remember in this story or in this particular set of DVDs, he told a story about how him growing up, he had a girlfriend and she broke his heart. And he was just deeply, deeply troubled by this girl who broke his heart. And I could relate to that because I had recently had my heart broken by a girlfriend and I remember feeling just so hurt and hurt that when you want someone to love you but they don't love you back hmm. or you desperately want to be with someone but that person doesn't want to be with you it's hurtful it hurts really really bad but in the in the message it was shared with me that that's how God feels about us how does God feel about us that when he, he wants an in-depth relationship he wants that intimate deep relationship with us he wants us to love him he wants the love reciprocated but how often do we break up with God and how often do we put push him away. It was at that time in my life that there was a transition that began to happen, that I began to see that, yes, while God is indeed the God of the universe, he is judge. He, Jesus Christ is my loving savior. And yes, all of that above, but at the end of the day, he's my friend. He loves me. He died for me. He gave his life for me. And he simply wants to have that relationship with me. I have used these three stories to communicate on many occasion, the wonderful works of God and the goodness of God in my life. And just within the past, four minutes, I was able to share with you how good God is and, and the beautiful salvation message that has affected me and that has transformed my life. My friends, that's as simple as it gets right there. Sometimes sharing the good news is all it takes. Yeah. Sharing what God has done for you, sharing how in faith you have accepted Based on what the Bible says, you've accepted in faith what Christ has done for you and you believe and have put your trust in him that one day you can stand as that confident, uh, changed person in Christ at the second coming of Jesus, ready for the kingdom of God. Something that simple could make a major difference in someone's life. And so Sunday's lesson to share the good news, that's one motivation behind witnessing to others because others need to hear that good news. Woo. Thank you for that wonderful and rousing introduction. I am Shelley Quinn. Monday's lesson is a prophetic foundation. I want to ask you a question. How relevant is the Old Testament to Christians today? Mm. I would submit to you there is no way you can understand the message of the New Testament if you do not know the Old Testament. Mm. And I'm not asking you to take my words for it. Let's look at John chapter 5 verses 46 and 47. Jesus is speaking to a group of Pharisees in John 5, 46, and he says to them, for if you believed Moses, mm -hmm. you would believe me, mm -hmm. for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, if you don't believe the writings of Moses, mm. first five books of the Bible, 
He says, how will you believe my words? I believe the reason that Moses is so important is because he introduces the covenant language and terms of God that then helps us to better identify Jesus Christ. But the Old Testament contains what is written in the New, and the New Testament explains what is written in the Old. On Resurrection Sunday, after he had resurrected, Jesus appeared to two disciples who were walking along the Emmaus Road in Luke 24. These are ordinary disciples. They're returning home. Their hearts are broken. Jesus comes along to them. This is after his crucifixion. He suddenly appears beside them. He says, what kind of conversation is this you're having? Why are you so sad? And the, the disciple named Cleopas unfolded the dramatic account of the story of Jesus, how he was this great prophet. They even thought maybe he was the Messiah. How he, the Romans had, and the, the Romans and the Jews, he'd been crucified and they, their hopes were dashed. And when they left Jerusalem, the women had said, oh, or someone had told them, the women said, hey, they saw angels at the tomb, he's risen. But there were no reports of anyone having seen him. So what happens? Jesus is going along and he says in Luke 24, 25, oh, foolish ones, mm -hmm. slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures from where? From the Old Testament, the things concerning himself. So launching into this Bible study, he provide, provided evidences from the Old Testament of who he was. They invited him to a meal. And during that meal, he opened their eyes and they finally recognized right. who he was. Mm -hmm. And then as suddenly as he appeared, he disappeared. Mm -hmm. And you know what they said to each other? Did not our hearts burn within us right. while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So now, boy, I'm telling you, they're filled with seal. Their hearts are ablaze. They take off running back for Jerusalem. This is Sunday, the day after the resurrection, or the day of the resurrection. And when they get to Jerusalem, guess where they find the 11 apostles, well, the apostles and the rest of the group. They find all these disciples behind locked doors for mm. fear of the Jews. Mm. And as they're recounting the story of what Jesus said to them along the road to Emmaus, suddenly Jesus appears and he says, peace to you. Well, they had just been through such a traumatic event beginning in Thursday with his arrest, his trials that were mockeries and his crucifixion. And their first reaction was fear. Was he a ghost? So Luke 24, 37, it says, oh, they were terrified and frightened and supposed they'd seen his spirit. And Jesus says to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart. Behold, my hands and my feet see that it is I myself. Handle me and see, mm -hmm. for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Mm -hmm. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet and they marveled and they, then he says to them, have you any food here? And what does he do? He eats a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb in their presence to prove he's not a ghost. Right. So what an incredible experience they had seeing the risen Savior. But guess what? Jesus knows incredible experiences fade. Look at the kids, the kids, the children of Israel. When they crossed over the Red Sea, God parted the Red Sea. They're singing the song, oh, he's our Lord and Savior. And mm -hmm. three days later, they're fussing and complaining. Experiences fade. So Jesus didn't want them 
to have the foundation of an experience only. He wanted to explain to them the prophetic foundation of his work and his ministry. And he says to them in Luke 24, 44, he says, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now, that is the accepted Jewish definition mm -hmm. of the entire Old Testament. Right. And so what does he do? He gives his second Old Testament study on the day of his resurrection. And it says, he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Mm -hmm. How important it is that we understand, you know, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a progressive mm -hmm. unfolding of God's revelation to us today. And if we don't understand the Old Testament, the New Testament, we will have it all skewed. Here's what the study guide says. It says, here too we find a powerful motivation for witness, for mission. And what is that motivation? the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew that to solidify the disciples' experience, they needed to understand why he had to die and what his resurrection signified. They needed their world view to be shifted from a political and earthly kingdom to the great solution to sin and the victory of Christ over sin and death. The gospel was so much more than achieving political sovereignty for Israel. And that's right. what the teachers mm -hmm. of Israel, what, that's what mm -hmm. they were ex expounding at the time. But it says it revealed Christ's victory over Satan and guaranteed that one day wickedness in the world would be destroyed, that the earth would be created anew, and that God would be among his people. The one Amen. thing that God is longing for is to be with us, Amen. that he right. would be our God and that we would mm -hmm. be his people and that he would dwell in our very midst. Amen. So what did Jesus do? He opened their understanding so that they could comprehend these truths mm -hmm. which they were to share with the world. Mm -hmm. And then it says, our experiences with Jesus cannot be sustained without the foundation of the Word. Yes. That's Even right. miracles won't sustain mm -hmm. your relationship with Christ. It has to be based on the Word, including the prophecies that point to the history and the events leading up to it and including the first and second advents of Christ. That means he, he came to earth, he took on our flesh, that was his first advent. But he has promised that he's preparing a place for us That's and right. that he's coming back. Amen. So with these truths firmly understood, we can be properly motivated to go out and share, not to correct people, mm -hmm. but to let people know the joy of the gospel mm -hmm. of God's yeah. grace and his salvation that he has planned for us, motivated by the word of God. Amen, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, my friends, we are just getting started, but we're going to take a short break and we will be right back in just a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hey friends, welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're going to toss it over to Pastor John Loma King for Tuesday's lesson. 
Yes, thank you, friends. Mine is waiting and mission. Have you ever heard the phrase, timing is everything? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not always true. If you have plugged in your iPad all night long and it didn't charge, timing is not everything unless you are connected. That's good. You know, when we think mm -hmm. about timing, you mm -hmm. can't wait on the Lord unless you know the Lord. Waiting on the Lord without being connected to Him is a frightening thing. It's looking forward to judgment and disappointment. Jesus did everything on time. You know, there were times in his life he said, the time is fulfilled or my hour has not yet come. And Galatians 4, 4 says, and when the fullness of time had come. So when we connect that to mission, timing is everything. God has a time for all of those he calls to participate in his mission. So be anxious for nothing. Don't hesitate when God says follow and don't run ahead of him when he's the one that should be leading you. In that context, timing is everything. We're going to be talking about waiting and mishing. Mission. That word has been fun today, hasn't it? We've got all been <laughs> mishing today. This word has been throughout our lesson and we smile when we hear somebody else mishes mishing when it's really mission. Let's go to Isaiah 40. We begin with verse 28. It's a fun word. You try saying that 10 times mm -hmm. and we're all getting affected by it some way, but in a good way. Isaiah 40 verses 28 to 31. I'm going to talk about waiting. I, I love this passage. It's used in a beautiful way. And Isaiah, you know, the book of Isaiah is one of my favorites and oh, yours yeah. too, and Romans and Isaiah, and then obviously the book of Revelation. But here we are. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? What comforting words. Mm -hmm. His understanding is unsearchable. Don't try to figure him out. Mm -hmm. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall fail, shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But here's my part. But those who do what, friends? Wait. Wait, Wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Mm -hmm. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting and mission. You know, my wife and I, uh, back, I, we've been including our stories in this because it's so apropos for the time. We were waiting to be involved in God's mission, but we had conditions. We said, Lord, we will do anything except go to California. And our waiting took a lot longer. But the week that we said, we'll go anywhere, including California, at the end of seven days, the invitation from California came. You know, when we think about God's timing and God's mission, it's always beautiful. And Dr. Luke so wonderfully puts God's work, his earthly work together. And he ends the book of Luke chapter 24 with the return of Jesus, the ascension from verse 50 down to verse 53. He talks about the fact that Jesus is coming again. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in verse 50, and he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, verse 51, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Mm -hmm. So when you read that, you understand that Dr. Luke also wrote the book of Acts yes. because it spells it so beautifully. Let's go to Acts chapter one and we're gonna to look together at verses four to verses eight. Now, I wanna just insert one before we go to uh, verses four to eight. I wanna just go back one verse in Luke chapter 24 because this fits into the complete picture of Acts chapter one. All right, so uh, I apologize if I had you go forward just to come backward. Here it is, <laughs> Luke 24 verse 49, it fits. You can see that Dr. Luke wrote both of the books. Jesus prefaces his missions with the word tarry and, and until. Mm -hmm. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. But what's the next word? Tarry. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem. What's the next word? Until, until you are imbued with power from on high. Mm -hmm. Now you go to Acts chapter one, mm -hmm. you begin to see the very same suggestion. Verse four, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to, what's the next word? Wait. Wait. Mm -hmm. Tarry is the same word mm -hmm. for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for truly John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized 
with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. There it is again, mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, mm -hmm. waiting. I want to bring out three very important points, and then I have uh, five points at the very end, very quick points. Mission comes to us on God's timetable, mm -hmm. not our timetable. That's right. Sometimes we say, oh man, I just can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. You know what? God knows when it's right to take you out of the oven. <laughs> Some of us are not well done yet. Some of us, God will never leave you in there to burn you. And I want you to be assured about that. God doesn't burn us. He prepares us, mm -hmm. but he knows when the time is right. And each of us are made of different texture. God knows based on our background, our experiences, our likes, our dislikes, our hindrances, and even our growth potential and our growth processes when the time is right to put us in the field of mission. God will not put us in his mission until he knows the time is right. That's why he says, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until. But here's the condition of waiting. Do not, to, do not depart from Jerusalem. Don't walk away from God's worship to get ready for God's mission. Mm. You good. gotta worship him while you get ready for mission. Mm -hmm. That's good. Stay at Jerusalem, keep worshiping me and the promise will come. And when the promise comes, it'll come in my timing and then I will know that you are ready to be sent. Mm -hmm. If you're waiting on God, worship him while you wait. If you're waiting on God to send you for mission, he knows when the time is right. Good. Preparation comes through worship. It doesn't come after. Preparation comes through worship. The other thing is, God provides power for the mission. Now, this is vitally important because we need intellect, we need understanding, we need to have knowledge. But sometimes you could have zeal not according to knowledge. That's where some people that are running ahead of God, you have to have zeal and knowledge together. But don't mix up knowledge with preparation always because knowledge alone without power is dangerous. Yeah. Some of the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable people on earth, knowledgeable people on earth are some of the most dangerous. Mm. But the Bible says, you shall be imbued with power from on high. You shall receive power. Now there is power, but then there's a difference when the power is from on high. Now there's lateral power. There's this horizontal power that many people say, do you know someone that could get me in ministry? We might know someone, but they may not be in contact with vertical power. Mm -hmm. So if you wait for God to open the door, it'll open when he knows the time is right. Some people might try to open doors and it will not happen. I know exactly what that is like. When I was praying to be involved in mission, I got a call to the Virgin Islands. Who wouldn't go to the Virgin Islands to be a mission? <laughs> Who wouldn't go? I prayed, Lord, do you want me to go to the Virgin Islands? He said, no. I got a call to Nebraska. I knew that was not God's call because I'm from <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> okay, Nebraska is not. But I prayed and the, that door closed also. I didn't want to go to California. That's where God opened the door. And when I went, God worked in a way that still to this very day amazes my wife and I as we look back. The third thing, God also establishes purpose for the mission. Mm. He said, you shall be witnesses. You see, the purpose of the mission is to be a witness, not for God, but to God. You yeah. shall be witnesses to me. That's why the Apostle Paul says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then he begins by saying, be diligent to present yourself approved unto God. Mm -hmm. Does God approve of you? If you know that God does not approve of you, if there's something in your life that God does not approve of, he's not going to send you to be involved in his mm -hmm. mission. Search your hearts. As David, pray that prayer. Lord, is there any wicked way in me? And when you know that you have done your part, God will surely do his part. When you read the book of Acts, chapter, 12, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 12 to 26, you'll find that there are so many conditions that were pointed out there. And the question is, what were they doing while they were waiting? Well, they were worshiping, they were praying, mm. and then they also prayed for God to put in that empty spot somebody that he know would take the place of Judas to be appropriate for the mission. And you know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 26, and it says, and they cast their lots and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. 
I have not lived with this ideology that I'm the only one. God always has someone other than me. Wait on the Lord and God's mission will be accomplished in your life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John, Shelley, Ryan. What an incredible lesson, motivation and preparation for mission. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at whom you crucified. And we're going to Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and Peter's, we call it Pentecostal sermon. But before we get there, this is Jill's outline of the entire lesson. And I think there's a five-fold preparation for mission that we see in this establishment of the early Christian church. The first step, this is five-fold preparation for mission. First step, Ryan covered it, experience God for yourself. That's the woman at the tomb experience. We cannot share what we have not experienced. Mm -hmm. If you wanna be involved in mission, experience God for yourself. Step number two, ground yourself in the word of God. Shelley covered that beautifully, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We cannot last on experience alone. We have to be grounded in the word of God. Step number three, Pastor John covered this, wait on God, wait in worship, in prayer, mm -hmm. in seeking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then you can organize for mission. Step number four is my day. Utilize the gifts from the Spirit for mission. Don't utilize them for self. That's right. Recognize that the gospel is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Finally, step number five, which Daniel is going to cover in just a little bit, disciple new believers. We cannot bring people into the church without taking time to mentor and disciple them. So let's look at Acts chapter two. The disciples had gathered as Pastor John already referenced in the upper room and they had spent those days in prayer and unity pleading for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then he came or in Acts two verses one through four. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Mm -hmm. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The first key, they were all in one accord in one place. So many times we think, Daniel, oh, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. And we're so divided. We're mm -hmm. so disunified. The first key, you have to be in one accord in one place. Then the Holy Spirit was poured out in the form of wind and fire. And they began to speak in other languages. God gave them the gift of tongues. Why was the gift of tongues given? Was it given so they could impress people with their gift? Was the gift of tongues given so they could conduct business in other languages? Was the gift of tongues given to glorify self? No. The gift of tongues was given for the proclamation of the gospel. Mm. That's why. It was given for the purpose of mission. Look at verse 5. We're in Acts 2, verse 5. They were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. So they spoke different languages. That's right. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Why? Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Mm -hmm. Verse 11, if you jump down there. They said, we hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. Now there's a couple of dangers before we get into Peter's Pentecostal sermon here. There's a couple of dangers that can take place. We can seek to share the gospel without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's a dangerous place to be in. You and I cannot share the gospel without the Spirit. I think so many times we think, I got it. I know the word or I'm prepared or I'm whatever. And we seek to witness, we seek to share without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We cannot share the gospel without the Holy Spirit. Ask and keep on asking. Luke chapter 11, verse nine through 13. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And not just a one-time thing, 
ask daily That's for right. the baptism and infilling of the Holy Spirit. Another danger with these spiritual gifts is that sometimes we can use them to selfish ends. Mm -hmm. We can use them for ourselves. Yep. The gift of speaking, pastoring, apostleship, mm -hmm. even singing is a tremendous gift. Mm -hmm. The gift of administration, helps, service, faith. Some people use those gifts for power. They mm. use those gifts for fame. They use those gifts to seek approval or earn merit or think somehow I can win brownie points with God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 67. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Right. It's so important when God pours out these gifts and you seek for the infilling of the Holy Spirit and to be filled with those gifts to share in mission that we not use it for ourselves. Now let's look at Peter's sermon. It was a powerful sermon because how many people were baptized at the end? Hmm. 3,000 oh. people were baptized at the end. We won't read it all. But he quotes from the Old Testament, shall he? The prophets and preaches to them of Jesus, the Messiah. Then he turns the accusation directly against the people. Or in hmm. verse 23, Acts 2, 23. Him, speaking of Christ, Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Jump down to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, I just want to stop a moment. That's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. You can speak and people, it doesn't mean anything. But when the Holy Spirit is there and the Holy Spirit accompanies, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon people. That has nothing to do with you or me or any of us. That's it's the right. Holy Spirit conviction. They were cut to the heart. The Holy Spirit was at work. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's amazing to me that the gospel is for everyone. The title of my lesson was Whom You Crucified. The gospel is even for those who physically crucified Jesus. Mm -hmm. The gospel is for all. Sometimes we tend to think that the gospel is only for certain people. We think the gospel, forgiveness and salvation, surely I'm going to get real with you, surely cannot be for my ex-husband who cheated on me. The gospel surely cannot be for the person who abused me. The gospel surely is not for a pedophile or a rapist or the murderer who sits in prison. We think the gospel surely is not for the person who lied about me and destroyed my reputation. The gospel is not for the person who cheated and stole from me. The gospel is not for the person who broke up my marriage or my family. And yet, the gospel is for all. The gospel is for the vilest and the lowest, the deepest, the darkest, the worst offender. I want to tell you today, the gospel's for me. The gospel's for you, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world Try it. that he gave. He mm -hmm. gave Jesus, his only begotten son, that whoever believes, it doesn't matter those who crucified Jesus, by extension, we all crucified Jesus because it was our sins, even if we weren't there presently, but it was our sins that took him to the cross. He went willingly, but our sins put him there. That whosoever should believe, on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So I don't know if you feel today that you've fallen too low, done too much, gone too far, that the gospel, surely Jill, is not for me. The gospel is specifically for you. Right. Jesus Amen. came that you could have life and have it more abundantly. He came to set you free. What do we do? We repent. We say, God, I recognize by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that I am a sinner. 
in need of a savior. Would you forgive me? And at that moment, you are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses you from all sin. At that moment, you can stand before Jesus as if you have never sinned. The gospel is for everyone, but the gospel specifically is for you. Amen. Amen. Yes, there are excellent thoughts shared today. And I, I think about it, we put the gospel out there by the airwaves, by our voice, by our lives, and we don't get to pick who gets to hear it. That's right. And uh, we don't get to pick who gets to respond. Well, if you want to know what I'm like, you could ask the people here. Uh, but if you really want to know what I like, what I'm like, you should ask probably my wife who has spent more time with me on earth than any other person uh, alive. And the same thing is true if we want to know what Jesus was like. Well, here's the disciples who walked with him. And so this is why we look at the early church. I'm Daniel Perrin. I have Thursday's lesson, a picture of the early church. Not that they were perfect, but they set an example of those who, who heard Jesus, who saw him, and were doing their best to follow in the footsteps he literally set for them. Acts chapter 2, verse 41, all the way through to 47, was going to see an example and pull out a couple of key words here. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. One day, 3,000. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wondered and wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily mm -hmm. those who were being saved. Now there's so much in this text uh, that it sets an example of how we as a church, how we as individuals can follow God. But I want to focus on just a couple of things the lesson brought out. Think about planning an event and you plan the event and as the time gets closer, maybe it's 30 minutes, 10 minutes, five minutes till and, and there's only a couple of people who are, are coming and you wonder, is, is anybody going to show up here? <laughs> well, finally you get started and you sit down and, and by the end maybe you turn back and look around and you realize, oh, the, the place got kind of filled up. There were more who added, all right? And by the way, let me just add a note here. God's events are worth coming to early, at the very least Amen. on time. Come to church, come to church on time. I know not everybody is able to do that, but uh, come to God's place on time. Anyway, that day, 3,000 souls, that's people, were added to the number. And I, you know, maybe you might picture somebody with a little clicker. <laughs> All right, how many are coming through? But see, this is more than just numbers and addition. I think of uh, the 11th son of Jacob, Joseph. His ma name means jo Jehovah has added. It wasn't just Jacob saying, oh, I got another mouth to feed. All right, here's another son. No, it was a, a, a gift, a special son they longed for from, from the wife that he loved, uh, Rachel. Um, and, and so this was an, a son added. God brought it specially. Uh, evangelism, see, is more than just numbers. It is people. There's a ministry that I've participated with recently called Streams of Light, handing out the great controversy in, in communities. And uh, so we, we go and we hand this out. And at the end of the day, they, they, they give us the numbers. Here's how many people requested Bible studies from the ministry, the outreach ministry today. And uh, it's exciting to hear hear that number. Yes, 35 people in this community today asked to study the Word of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. But that has to be followed up. It's more than just numbers. It has to be followed up with something because no parent, no mother gives birth to a child in the hospital and then turns around and walks out the door expecting the infant to follow along behind. Mm. <laughs> they have to be That's nourished right. That's right. and cared for. They have to be taught and strengthened and, and that goes on for a very long time. Mm. Membership 
joining, adding of numbers must be followed up with discipleship, mm -hmm. the adding of maturity. We know what disciples are, all right? We could name the disciples Jesus had, but the word disciple simply means student. Mm -hmm. Discipline just means teaching. And so how did that happen? Acts 2.42 says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Doctrine, it's the Greek word didache. From the teaching world, we, we say didactic. Use that word a, lo a lot. It just means teaching. Mm -hmm. There's good doctrine. There are things in each book, each chapter, each page, each verse that need to be learned. Almost every field you work in has continuing ed. You go get some continuing education credits. Well, if we do that for, for some sort of field that you work in, isn't the word of God uh, needful of continuing education? Right. If ever we get to the point where we say, I've, I've, I've learned it all. <laughs> All right, every, every one of us knows we're in foolish territory there. Our capacity for learning is infinite and will continue on forever. All right, but fellowship, all right, there's the word koinonia, mm -hmm. community, family, participation, uh, communion, communication. They're breaking bread. I know that when, when our family has invited people over for a meal, we eat and then we sit around and talk and we say, hey, you want to join us for family worship? And that one meal then continues a time of, of togetherness where things, uh, you know, change hands. Potlucks are a good idea because we sit and minister to each other in conversation and prayer. Listen to what Paul says here in Romans 1. 1, 11 and 12. He says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and of me. And so Paul recognizes we're, we're both going to encourage each other here. There's one thing we learned when churches were shut down, that you can make do with connecting online, but we need to be together. Uh, the Christian life, it's, it's not taught as much as it is caught. In the teacher world, we do three things. I do it, we do it, you do it. Yes, that's All right? good. I show you, and then we work together. In my home right now, there's a, a young lady who's learning how to drive. How does that work? She's watched me and my wife, and now I'm helping her, but then eventually she'll get her license and I'll have to stand at the curb while she drives away and say, you, you now do it. Listen to what Ministry of Healing, <laughs> page 143, ver, uh, paragraph four says, there is need of coming close to the people by personal yes. effort. We've got to be working together closely. We're a family of God. We call each other brother and sister. And there is no, there is no level of the Christian life where we don't have discipleship. Two texts here, Philippians 1, verse 9, and this I pray that your love may still abound more and more. Paul looking for their continual growth. And now Philippians 3, 13 and 14, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. I'm not done growing. At the end of that verse 14, I press on toward the goal. So is there discipleship going on in your life? Moses, he died at 120 years old and he was discipling. He was discipling Joshua, who was 90 years old and being discipled. Elijah to Elisha, Paul to Timothy. Jesus disciples all of us. All right. Matthew 10 verse 25 says, It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. So let me take you down to the challenge. Each lesson here challenging you to do something because discipleship does not just happen. It's intentional. 39% of Christians, according to a recent Barna poll, say they have no discipleship relationship. In other words, there's nobody who is either helping them to grow who are they are to helping to grow. So two questions. Number one, who are you discipling? Who is it that you have a relationship that God has placed there? Someone maybe new in the faith. Somebody you know, and it's oftentimes, though not always the case, somebody who's younger than you, who you can say, I've walked this path before, and here's how God helped me to do it. Let me share with you what I've done. Who are you discipling? Think about it, write it down. Lord, if I don't have anybody, who's around me? And number two, who's discipling you? Mm. Don't let pride get in the way. Usually right. there'll be someone older than you to say, could you help me to learn what I need to know? Learn how to pray, learn how to study the Bible, learn how to witness, learn how to live in the judgment hour, learn how to do these things. Let me address parents. Are you discipling your children? 
mm. by precept and example. That's right. This is the discipleship relationship that God has placed right here for you, right now. Mm. These relationships keep us from slipping away from the body of Christ because some people say, if I left, who would notice? Well, if you had someone who was discipling you or someone you discipled, people would notice. Amen. Where'd they go? We're not letting them go. We're, we're in a relationship together. I want to take us back here at the end to the addition because the days of Christian addition are not over. Cole Porter Ministry 151 paragraph 3 says, More than 1,000 will soon be converted in a day, in one day, most of whom will trace their first conviction to the reading of our publications. But when people leave confusion, where are they going to go? To the internet? they are going to go to people like you, like me, who say, let's have a relationship. Let me share with you what Jesus has done for me and what he can do for you. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. On fire down there. I like it. Praise the Lord. Let's get some final thoughts. Please understand the entire Bible is a continuing narration of the story of the Messiah Christ, his foretelling and his arriving and his soon return. That's right. And while you're waiting, wait together in worship and in praise of the Lord. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Utilize the gifts from the Spirit for mission, not self, and recognize that the gospel is to, supposed to go to everyone. I believe there will be discipleship in heaven, mm -hmm. fellowship, teaching and learning, breaking bread, all of those things where we will share our experience teaching others what we have known of Jesus. There's always more to learn. Mm. That's right. Amen, amen. Thank you guys so much for a powerful lesson study. My friends, I hope you are motivated to go out and witness for Jesus Christ. Time is of the essence. Jesus is coming back mm -hmm. soon. And you know what? You may be uh, watching this program week after week and thinking, you know what? I want to be a better witness. I want to witness, but I just don't know if I have what it takes to go out and share maybe what I know or maybe something I need to learn and, and myself and go out and share later once I have prepared. You know, we have to be reminded that there's a lot that we cannot do in and of our own power and in and of our own efforts. But the Bible reminds us very clearly in that beautiful promise, that powerful verse, Philippians chapter four, four verse 13, <laughs> I can do how many things? All, All things. things. All things through Christ. That's the key. Through Christ who strengthens me. My friends, you don't want to miss next week because we're going to be talking in lesson number seven, studying mission to my neighbor. We all have a neighbor that we need to be witnessing to. Tune in next week to find out how we do it.